Um, hello everyone, good afternoon and we are glad to have you here. We are hoping to have more people joining us. Um, Dr. Chris Bandit is the Chief Executive Officer of South Africa's Milk Producer Organization in South Africa. He has a couple of years of experience in um, this dairy sector and is going to be sharing with us some knowledge on um, managing dairy, dairy cattle health. Um, welcome, Dr. Chris. Um, the floor is yours now. Fizayu, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. You know, it's, it's a privilege to be here today. Um, I've been working together with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've been working uh, together with um, Dr. Dr. Ubai. Um, and yeah, I've met you now recently, and it's, it's a privilege to be here today. As you said, you know, I've been around in the industry for, for many years. Um, I think this year is um, almost uh, 39 years. So I'm, I'm going for 40 years, you know, being qualified as a vet. Long, 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 long ago qualified as a vet. Then I, I did my specialization uh, specifically in bovine herd health. Um, I, I worked for about 18 years as a specialist, as a veterinary specialist. Um, then I joined um, a pharmaceutical company and there I stayed for about 15 years. In that 15 years, I was um, business development director, marketing director, techni technical director. And then about five years ago, I joined the, um, the milk producers organization. Now, the milk producers organization is, is a, uh, basically it's a non-profit organization representing all the dairy farmers in South Africa. And I will share with you now a little bit later on about uh, the South African dairy industry. And then the question is, you know, when you, um, and I thank you again for everybody that's in this uh, masterclass. I think, you know, if and not because I'm a veterinarian, but I think it's a, it's a very, very important part. If, if you want to uh, run a successful business and a successful um, industry and an enterprise, you need to look at the health of the animals. The animals need to be healthy. If the animals are not healthy, you know, then, then it becomes a welfare issue. They're going to, to um, produce suboptimally. And then that's not what we want. In the end, as you know, it's a, it's a food producing animal. And especially in a dairy animal, we would like to get as, as much milk out of this dairy cow as, as we can get. Now, you know, the, the reason then for this dairy cattle um, manage, or health management, um, as I said on this first slide, I'm going to do a synopsis. It's impossible, you know, we study for six years. And then to, to summarize in, in, I've got a little bit more than an hour or, or an hour to, to present to you. Um, you know, on dairy cattle health management, and it's impossible to, in, in one hour, to describe or to summarize everything that we did study in, in six years. And then, as, as I said, you know, always say, um, you need to keep on studying. I think it's a good thing. And again, congratulations and thank you for attending this course or this, this master class, because as I said, it's very, very important. You know, the more, the more you learn, um, the more you can come, become, become involved and then actually understand what's going on in your head and so on. I, I do understand that we do have some veterinarians on board and then also um, dairy farmers today. So yeah, uh, pl please, unfortunately, I can't see you or I can't see any questions, um, but, but pl please on the chat box, uh, please put your questions there and then we can take care of it afterwards. Um, now, the, the reason for this, you know, this is a slide that I took from from Sial Consulting, and I'm not going to do everything, but if you have a look there at the bottom there, you know, this bottom part there that I've, I've put the red block around, farmers do not have adequate access to services such as training and animal health due to the limited um, availability of skilled dairy professionals. I, I was fortunate, you know, I could spend, as I said, almost 40 years in the dairy industry, and unfortunate, you know, to learn a lot of, um, especially around diseases and production and reproduction and all the other things. But, but this is the reason why we're actually presenting this today to you people. Now, if you look at um, the South African um, dairy environment, as I said, you know, well, um, we've got about uh, 1,200 um, commercial dairy farmers in, in South Africa producing about 3.3 billion liters of milk. Um, on a yearly basis, that's an average of about 18 to 19 liters per cow um, all over in the country. Then, then we also, you know, if you can see my mouse uh, moving there, we've also got, um, you know, se several commer commercialization projects running where we actually will, will take the hand off of the emerging or the smallholder or the uh, as part of uh, rural development projects. We will take the hand of that farmer and, and see if we can take him to the next level. You can see on the left hand side there, you know, the typical 
um, small older dairy farm, milking by hand, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we, we all start at the beginning, um, I think most dairy farmers did start there. And then you can get to the, you know, the typical um, rotary dairy farm that, that you do get. The average um, dairy farm in South Africa is almost about 400 cows um, per herd. And then we've got uh, one macro herd up um, in, a, in a certain part of the country milking 11,000 animals. So it's important, you know, to, to understand, and I'm, I'm going to, to speak to you, you know, from the subsistence level, in other words, the guy with one, or the person with one or two cows up to the commercial dairy farmer, including everything. But in the end, it doesn't matter where you actually, whether you're in the subsistence, um, acting as a subsistence or a smallholder farmer, in the end, you know, this is um, a sick animal is a sick animal. And you need to understand how to diagnose it, how to recognize it, and then how to take it forward. You know, what are you going to do to prevent the problem there? So I, I would like to, to use this um, triangle then as the basis of our discussion. This is just a quick comparison between South Africa and Nigeria. Um, currently, we number 38 in the world when it comes to milk production. As I said, about 3.5 billion liters or 3.5 million tons of milk. Um, compared to Nigeria, you know, these are the numbers that I got from the IFCN uh, presented um, in 2018. Um, you can see, you know, there's a, um, quite a, a substantial difference um, there the, between the two, current, the, the two countries. And then, yes, we're also milking about 615,000 cows compared to Nigeria, um, 4.4 um, 4 um, or 4,400 cows. Um, if you look at the population, you know, South Africa is about 60 million people. And if I'm correct, you know, Nigeria could be three or almost four times more, um, you know, almost 200 million people in, in Nigeria. So I think a dairy cow, you know, I see a dairy cow, if you look at food security, most definitely a dairy cow is part of food security. If you, um, if you do have dairy cows, you can be, be, be very rich in the sense of you've got food, you can provide food to the people out there. So I'm going to discuss this. Um, I think a very, very important um, difference also between the two countries. As I said, we're producing about 18 to 19 liters of um, milk per, uh, per lactation, you know, per lactation, um, um, 5,600 liters compared to um, 120 liters on the right hand side in Nigeria, and then about 18 liters compared to 0.39 liters per cow. And this is, this is where animal health is coming in. You know, a healthy cow, as I said, um, can produce milk and then that, that will actually take it forward. So what I'm going to do is, and I, I will touch quickly on, on these topics. You can see there's um, six topics there. Uh, first of all, you know, to understand where are we operating. I think we need to understand what we, what we call the, the biological um, life cycle of a cow. You know, the biological from, from conception, you know, when the... Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Can you please go on mute if you are not speaking? Um, Dr. Chris, sorry about that. I think you can continue. Okay. Yeah, sorry, um, Fizai. I, I can't see anything, so I don't know what's uh, happening. You know, if there's nobody in the class, it's also okay. Um, then you can send them the recordings later on. But yeah, it's, it's, you, you must just shout if, if, if you want to stop me or if I need to repeat so, some more. So I would ask um, the participants to drop their questions on the chat box and then after you are done with your presentation i can um take them one um at a time then you can um answer the questions okay thank you thank you okay so we're going to look at the biological life cycle of a cow um i need to touch on the um what we call epidemiology of disease you know now epidemiology a basic summary of that is basically you know all the role players the, the host factors the environmental factors and the pathogens over time, you know, the different roles that they play. And then I will share you a little bit more on that. And then we will touch on management programs, not in detail today. And then I will go to certain cattle diseases, you know, that um, I'm looking at, at your programs and so on. And there's, there's a lot of similarities. Again, you know, if you look at Africa, um, a lot of diseases um, are actually the same compared to the U.S. and to Europe. You know, they've got completely different um, diseases there. And then I would like to... Uh, touch on the role of the veterinarian and then one or two um, slides about biosecurity and what we need to bring in place. Now, if you look at the biological life cycle of a cow, you, it all starts at the left there. You know, it's, um, you know, there's a sperm, a sperm coming from the bull, from the semen. That will go into the cow and eventually that cow conception will, will um, take place. Um, that cow will conceive and then gestation. You all know that uh, gestation is about 
278 days on average is about nine months, you know, to, to make it easy, um, from conception till birth. And then this, this is, again, you know, this is a very, very important part. If, if you look at, um, you know, where, where do you look at animal health um, or, or cow's health and so on, this is a very, very important part during that uh, gestation period and then also around birth, you know. So if, if you do have a normal calving there, you can be sure, you know, that that cow will calf again in about 365 days. But if you do have a problem there, you know, during the birth, birth process and so on, uh, you're going to run into problems and then you can run up to 400, 450 days. And that's, again, it's an economic um, issue. You know, you, you're going to lose a lot of money, um, especially if you've got low, low productions, you know, um, 5 or 10 or 20 or 50 liters per cow. That cow should calf every year. Every 365 days, that cow should be in calf. And then she should um, give you a healthy calf every, every 365 days. You know, that's the ideal that we... Um, um, uh, trying to get to. Now, if you look at uh, the next stage after birth, you know, from birth, is, it takes about 23, 24 months um, for, for heifer rearing, first of all, calf rearing, and we're not going to discuss um, calf rearing in detail today. But, but then you need to look at uh, calf rearing, you know, you need to look at um, weight gain, the body condition score of that animal, very, very important to, to take note of that, because if, if, if you fail there as a, a very young calf, if you fail there, the heifer is not going to be a heifer in time, and um, this animal is not going to calf again in time. So on average, um, the, the animal should be calving at about 23 to 2, 24 months and for the first time again. So then, then it's uh, the whole calving process. You know, we, we need to, to get milk out of this cow. This is why we actually, um, um, you know, uh, put, put the, cow to, the cow to the bull to the bull and get her pregnant. And then from there on, you you will then um, have your milk production. With a typical um, milk production curve there, you can see, you know, usually after calving, there will be for three to five days, <coughs> there, there will be colostrum. Um, the colostrum will be there, and then that colostrum is very, very important also to that little calf. Because a very, very important thing is, you know, within about six to 12 hours after calving, that little calf should get at least two to two to four liters of high quality colostrum because that calf is born without any immunity. There's no antibodies and then you can only get it from the colostrum. And then after about five, six days, you, you can actually start milking this cow and the, the milk can go, go into the tank or into the container. And then you can, you know, the typical curve that you will get is like that. So it will go up and at about 60, 70 days, it will peak and then gradually it will start going down. And then during this period, about 80 days after calving, um, the, the animal should be bred again. That cow should be bred again. Um, if she can be bred um, be within um, fifth, um, 85 days after calving, she will then calf again um, 60, um, uh, 365 days or one year later. And then another place where you need to, need to look at animal, animal health is the dry period. You know, a cow need to be dry for a minimum of 50 days, 50, 60 days on average. Um, but also what, what one needs to see is the dry period is not the end of the previous lactation. It's the beginning of the next lactation. There's a lot of things when it comes to animal health that you can do there. You can vaccinate the animals. You can deworm them. There's a lot of things that you can do there. And then, um, unfortunately, when, yeah, it's part of this whole thing. Um, every year, you know, on, on 100 cows, you need to replace um, the, the 100 animals by, by culling or slaughtering, you know, or selling at least 25 of, of that 100 animals. And then you need to bring in about an, uh, another about 25 new young animals every year. So that's if, if you look at, you know, to, to actually to, to grow your herd and then to get more animals, um, you know, you need to, to cull, the, the, cull the animals. So that's also part of um, this whole cycle. So okay, uh, if you look at the epidemiology, as I said, epidemiology, basically a triangle and you can read on your on the right hand side there but i will discuss it from from the um, triangle on the left hand side you can see in this triangle there's these three um, factors they're playing a very very important role um, if those factors if the husbandry is not in place and if the management is not in place as i've indicated in the middle you will sit you will be you will have a, a sick animal you know if you look at the host factors the host, host factors the natural resistance the passive immune status, you know, in other words, I, I did quickly refer to the colostrum. If those animals are not um, exposed to, to good quality colostrum at a very young age, 
those animals will become sick and you're going to sit with a lot of um, sick and a lot of dead, dead calves and then your herd is just going to get smaller and smaller and eventually, you know, you, you will start doing something else. But, but dairy farming is not going to work for you then. Um, uh, also, the, the age, you know, we need to look at the age, you need to look at the production status, the reproductive status. These are all factors that you need to take into consideration. You know, if you look at a disease like milk fever, uh, milk fever, some, some of the environmental factors could be the ration. And the ration could be um, having um, very high levels of potassium and so on. That could be eventually suppressing the, the calcium in the animal. So if this animal is pregnant, um, the, the calcium levels are very low, then you can sort of a problem like, like a milk fever as, a, as an example, or what we call a hypercalcemia. And then especially in, in Africa, you know, we need to look at all the vectors. You know, there's ticks, there's flies, um, there's mosquitoes. Um, and then I'll, I'll get to that, you know, I'm transmitting these diseases. So in the end, this, um, you know, if I frequently do certain exams as an external examiner, and if, if I ask a, a question about the disease and at least the student can tell me, it's a, you know, what's the reason for, say, for lumpy skin disease? And he tells me it's multifactorial. I will at least give him 50% because there's a lot of factors that you need to take into consideration. You need to look at the, the tick load, the tick burden. You need to look at the, the time of the year, you know, as, a, as an example here at the bottom. Um, if it's um, as an example, and I'll, I'll get a little bit later on, I'll get to the rainfall pattern in, in Nigeria. Um, you know, if you know what's the rainfall pattern, you can actually prevent a lot of problems, especially when you get, when you get to your, your tick-borne diseases. Um, but yeah, well, one need to, to, to put the, um, or, um, need to take everything into consideration when it comes to animal health and animal disease. And then also very important, you, you need to understand and then clearly understand, you know, what, what is the appearance of a healthy animal? Because there's different systems, you know, I've listed it there on the left. On the right hand side, you can see a nice picture, you know, with the, or with the inside of the cow there. You know, with the lungs at the lungs at the front, the heart at the bottom there, it's, I mean, you can't really see it. And the liver here, and then on, on this side would, would have been the abomasum, you know, that you can see there, um, part of the rumen there, you know, the small intestines and so on. And then a very important part of the dairy cows naturally is also the other. You know, so, so one will look at the different systems and then you need to understand what, what you know, as an example, if it's a, it's a toxin, a toxin can affect maybe the nervous system, or it can affect the kidneys, or it can affect the digestive system. You know, there's, there's certain toxin, toxins that will only have an effect on the rumen and it will burn the rumen on the inside. Um, urea is an example. If you've got high levels of urea, it will have an effect on the, on the rumen, but eventually um, this cow will go down with nervous symptoms and you will have a problem there. So important also to look at that. And then just uh, the um, last you know, would be before we get to the really into the um, diseases itself, one need to look whether you've got one or uh, okay, if you've got one one cow, you know that's your herd. But say say you've got uh, ten animals, ten animals, one of them could be sick, one of them could could have actually um, do have um, uh, will be uh, clinically sick, clinically affected. Actually, mean you can see this animal is sick. You know, if you look at um, hemorrhagic um, septicemia as an example that you do get in Nigeria uh, caused by pastorella, you know, if you do see if you do see uh, see one sick animal below <coughs> below the surface of this, you know, take, take this as a as, as the water level there below this water level, there could be a lot of subclinically affected animals, and then some of the animals will be healthy. So, in other words, one need to look at well, yes, one one sick animal is an indicator. There's a problem in the herd. But below that, how many actually other, other animals are subclinically affected? And that's the important part that, that one needs to look at and, and to really understand um, disease as such. If, if you look at risks, you know, there's many risks. Uh, this is a photo that I took in, in Zimbabwe there at, uh, at the Victoria Falls. But if you go and do bungee, bungee jumping, you know, you get people that like doing things like that. But if you do bungee jumping without a rope, then it's a huge risk that you can actually end up in the water at the bottom there. And there, there's crocodiles, there's, you know, there's rocks. There's a lot of things that can injure you. So you can see this um, guy jumping on that rope. He did prevent, or he actually looked at the risk and he put a, a rope around his legs. And there's some other risk also, you know, this is a very, very beautiful cow at, at the show. You can see a beautiful um, dairy adder. 
a beautiful animal. But um, getting that winning prize there, you know, that, that is part of why you do go to the show. But if you bring this animal back into your herd, this animal has now been exposed to, to several other animals, has been exposed to different people and so on. It, it can actually, together with that um, big price, you know, that, that's there, maybe the price money that you're taking back home, you're going to carry a lot of disease, or you could carry a lot of disease back, back into your herd, and that could be the problem. And then, you know, some of the other problems, you know, um, uh, foot and mouth is just as an example, you know, typical, this is a very, very high risk. And you can see some of, some of the risk in the dairy herd or in the dairy sector, you know, there's business risks that we're not going to discuss today, environmental risks, food safety, occupational health, public health, all risks that can actually affect the, 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 um, the dairy herd as such. But the very important ones, animal health, animal welfare, biosecurity that are listed in red there, that, that we always need to um, take into consideration when you look at um, risk in the, in the dairy sector. I'm not going to discuss this, it's not necessary, you know, that, that part there. So if you get the management programs itself, you know, management programs itself, there's different programs available. I, I First of all, I think if, you know, if you would like to, to get more information, um, I will send you this presentation um, for Zaya afterwards, and then the people can go and have a look there. But I think it's just it's very small at the top there, um, but I think you can see it at the, at the bottom here. Um, you know, go to www .npo.co.za, then you, you will get to this landing page. On that landing page, there's um, different links at the top there. It's uh, to the Institute, you know, this is to the Institute of Dairy Technology, AgriInspect, AgriConnect, Dairy Mail, uh, Milk SA, the National Animal Health Forum. And, and you know, this uh, this is a, a very a good source of information where you can go, go and click on it and you can learn a little bit more there. If you click on the left top there on the Institute itself, you, you will go to another site. Um, this is um, something that we do, you know, that we offer to, to our um, fellow um, dairy farmers in South Africa. And you can see this is some of the, the lectures or the classes that we uh, did present to the people. Um, yes, we do a lot of things. You know, this this is a, what we call the, the dairy occupational qualification. I think you've got something similar going in Nigeria. But these are all available, you know, these are, as an example, available um, on electronic, available on e-learning, um, the different uh, modules on the, on the right-hand side there. We've got 13 different, it's accredited modules. These are uh, modules that's available. And then you, uh, there you can actually take yourself, you know, from a dairy farm worker to a dairy farm supervisor, eventually to a dairy farmer. And then this is, you know, this is a, a post-school certificate that you can actually get in dairy farming. So I'm, I'm prepared more um, for, for, for Zio. I already did discuss it with, with them at, at SIL, um, you know, to, to, um, to assist you people, you know, to, um, to get access, first of all, get access to this information, but, but then also to make use of this, to, to equip, uh, equip yourself. And as I said, you, you can never stop learning, especially on a daily farm. It's a, a techno, a, a technology is, is the name of the game. If you can get ahead of that, of the technology, you can get ahead of the, of the game. If you're going to, if, um, if you start falling behind, um, you're not going to be a dairy farmer anymore in future. Um, you know, unfortunately, animal health and all the other things will be a problem. And then we've also got a, a skills development program. This is a, I'll call it, it's, a, it's one level below what, what I showed you just now. But you can see the dairy production, artificial insemination, animal husbandry, animal diseases and biosecurity at the right bottom there. All these things are available. And there's also another thing that we do have available and there's the, the link to it, um, HTTPS um, colon double slash, um, double slash not it dot online. You can also go to that and um, to that um, that's available. It's unfortunately not for free, but there you will see on beef production nutrition, you know, there's video material on, on the dairy itself, there's about 120 hours of video material available that you can access on um, daily production nutrition, on daily production management, and, and um, uh, um, herd health as such. So that, that's an, enough from where you can get resources. You know, this is just a, um, from what I got from, from Fizayo, you know, on the annual, annual cattle health plan um, from Sahel. You can see on the left-hand side there, Blackwater, foot and mouth, um, CBPP, I'm not going to discuss that in detail today, 
But CBDP is a huge problem. It's, it's fortunately not in South Africa yet, but it's already in Botswana. It's already in Namibia. So we, we and then maybe we can come and learn some lessons from, from Nigeria how to contain this disease. But I think it's, it's also very important, you know, to, to look at the other diseases. Anthrax. Anthrax is a acute disease. Um, it can kill an animal tonight. The animal is healthy. Tomorrow, that morning, that animal can be um, dead. And then you also do have your, your problems with um, trypanosomiasis. Uh, tri um, so that's a basic program that, that um, can be available. This is, you know, and this may be a little bit small on your screen, but this is a very basic um, dairy management program. If somebody asks me about the program, you know, this is what I will give to them. There's, there's a program, first of all, for the young animal, for the um, young calf, you know, from, from um, say, say from, from where it's um, actually born, you know, on day one. So the, this is, these are the age of the animal, day one, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, up to day 10, what you need to do. And there's the vaccines that you need to give, deworming that you need to give, uh, tick, tick and fly control that you need to look at, vitamin um, vitamin injections that you need to give, and then, then some of the other actions. So again, you know, if you would like to, I, I will share you with you later on my, my email address and so on. And you're welcome, you know, I can send this to you and you can rework this and make it then uh, work for, for yourself. It's not necessary, you know, this is almost everything that you need to do. It's not, and then I, I, again, I would recommend that you go and sit down with your, uh, with your technician, you know, the guy that's giving you information, or go and sit down with your veterinarian and ask him, you know, is this really necessary? You know, this is what they're doing in South Africa, but this is really necessary for, uh, for Nigeria. And um, there you can see the first calf heifer and then what you need to do for the, for the adult cow. So, okay, that's, that's the very basic things on, on what you need to do. When you get to, to animal health disease, you know, and I, um, I think I've got about half an hour to, <laughs> to discuss uh, six years of, of studies with you, with you people now. So I'm going to touch quickly on some of the diseases. And um, this will be available, you know, for, for reading later on. And then I've, you know, I try to summarize the diseases, but I think it's also too important. How do you look at diseases? I sit on the right hand side there, look at the different systems. You know, one can look at it, approach it from a, from a production cycle. You can also look at the classification. You know, this is the classification. You get viruses, you get bacteria, you get protozoa, you get rickettsias, you get internal parasites, you get external parasites. Viruses is like, like COVID-19. You can't see the thing. It's, it's so small, you know, it's, um, 50, uh, COVID virus, as an example, the coronavirus is about uh, 50 nanometers. Now, nanometer, this is one meter times 10 to the, min to the power of minus nine. So it's, it's a very, very small bacteria on the other hand, bacteria, most of the bacteria, you can see it under ordinary microscope, protozoa, protozoa is an organism, I would say it's almost between a virus and a bacteria. And then the same with a rickettsia, the, that you can usually see under a microscope. So I, I will first start off with, with the viral diseases. And I think something that, that you do know, you know, there's a map of Nigeria on the right-hand side there, um, where you find, you know, the different serotypes that you do find, um, serotype O, serotype A, SAT1, SAT2. In South Africa, we, we only find, um, do find the green and the purple ones. Um, uh, um, serot uh, SA, um, or the serotype SAT1 and SAT2. But this The very important thing of this, this is a highly contagious viral disease of animals. And I think it's one, one of the most serious livestock diseases in the, um, in the world. And a lot of, you know, countries like, like the U.S., they don't want this disease there. Unfortunately, you know, we, um, in Africa, you know, this is one of the problems that we do, do have. And you need to contain this. Um, it can affect um, most definitely cattle, you know, and cattle, whether it's beef or dairy cattle, buffalo, camel, sheep, goats, deer, and also pigs. So anything that has got a, a cloven hoof, um, can be can affect it. You know, it can't affect horses, it can't affect donkeys and so on. But but if you if the animal has got a cloven hoof like a pig or like a cow, um, it can get um, a foot and mouth disease. Now typically what will you see? You will see a pyrexia, you know, that's just a fancy word for, for high, high temperature, the ordinary or the normal temperature of a cow about um, 38, 38.5 degrees Celsius. Um, this um, animal, um, you know, the temperature will go up to about 40, 42 degrees um, immediately, you know, de or de during the incubation and the infection period. Very, very important on a dairy, on a dairy cow, 
the reduced milk volume, you know, for two to three days. So if you're milking 10 liters a day, that milk will, will go down to one or two liters a day. And you can think for yourself, you know, you're going to lose um, a lot of money because um, if that happened. Um, some of the t typical symptoms, you know, if you do get that lesion, like, like that cow on the right hand side, um, they, they will start um, this um, smacking of the lips. So they will start, um, you know, this you know, it's difficult to, <laughs> I, I can show it to you, but um, the smacking of the lips will be there. Um, teeth grinding will be there because it's sore. It's, it's hurting on the inside of the mouth. So they will go, start uh, grinding their teeth. Another thing is, is drooling. You know, drooling, very important. It will start um, the, the saliva. A cow will circulate about 100 to 120 liters of, of saliva every day through its mouth. But, but, okay, if there's a problem there, you know, if there's a problem in the teeth, it will start drooling. If it has got foot and mouth disease, it will start drooling. A very, very important, what we call a DD or differential diagnosis, um, is rabies. Um, I don't know if rabies is such a problem in, in Nigeria, but most definitely in South Africa and certain parts. If you do have a cow that with, with saliva dripping out of the mouth, don't put your hand into that cow's mouth, you know, because it, the possibility could be there that it is foot and mouth, and then you can become in, infected. And then unfortunately, you know, if you become infected, um, there's, in, in most cases, um, you know, there's not a lot that they can do for you. Um, lameness, you know, because the, the disease is foot and mouth disease, so, so the hoofs will also be affected. And then sometimes this stamping or kicking of the feet could also be a symptom. And then also, unfortunately, it's a viral disease. You know, there's no specific treatment for um, FND. Um, the con conventional way, way that we actually do treat it in South Africa, um, you know, those animals will be immediately isolated. Um, but, but you can treat it with antibiotics. The antibiotics will not do nothing to the virus because antibiotics will not work against the virus. Um, but, but yes, it will actually take care of the secondary infection. And then also some of your anti-inflammatories like Phoenixin and so on. And then also mild disinfectants can also do, do some work there. Okay, so yeah, there's vaccination. I'm not going to do, um, discuss it in detail. Um, just to, to make you alert, you know, foot and mouth is prevalent. You can see it's um, on, on the western side in, in Nigeria, southwestern Nigeria and the Oyo district. And then also Kaduna you know, Nasa, Nasarawa and so on in the central parts of, of, of Nigeria itself is a huge problem there. So please take note of this. Um, you know, it's an important disease in your country and also in our country. Um, lumpy skin disease, you know, we call it Knopfel sector, you know, it's a very descriptive disease. Um, for falling the, for forming these little knobs on the outside there. You can see it actually there, you know, you can see it there. You know, this is a viral disease. It's, um, and this is my going to be my approach for the for the rest of the presentation. A short summary: it's um, it's transmitted directly by insects by, by biting insects. It's usually a disease that's associated by, by with rain and so on. So during the raining period, you can get a problem there, and it will be a bigger problem during the raining period. You can get it throughout the year, um, and I think especially in Nigeria, you know, where it's much more humid and then much warmer, you know, you can actually get it throughout the year. But what you will see, okay, the other thing is you can also transmit it by, by needles and instruments. So if you do have an animal that's sick, don't use that same needle where you injected an antibiotic or vaccinated this animal. Don't use it on the same animal because, or on the next animal, you're going to transmit the disease by doing it like that. Some of the clinical symptoms that you will get, a um, high temperature also about 40, 42 degrees Celsius, and then you will start getting these lumps on the animal. Um, there will be a discharge from the nose, and the eyes can be infected like that. Um, you know, weight loss, uh, abortions also will be because of the high temperature. I think the best is, you know, get a, get a veterinarian there, ask him to do what you need to do, um, and ask him you know, whether you can use antibiotics and so on. But then a very, very important thing, animals need to be vaccinated. We usually in South Africa, we vaccinate the animals at about seven months of age, the young calf. Um, and then we repeat it on a yearly basis. So, okay, that's, that's on lumpy skin disease. Um, Rift Valley fever, I think also a problem in, in your area. Um, and again, I'm not going to read all these things to no, people now. Um, there is a vaccine available, but the very important thing, if you see this little logo there, it's called a zoonosis. A zoonosis is a disease that can be transmitted from animals to, um, to humans and from, from humans to animals. 
Sorry, can you can you guys just mute your, your just mute yourself, please? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, this this is you know if you, if you do know that there's Rift Valley fever around, this is transmitted by mosquitoes, um, biting insects. Um, please do not open that carcass because you can get the disease. One of the um, symptoms you can actually die from this. But one of the things that, that you will see in humans is that, that you can become blind. So please take, take care of this. If you see this um, sign there, um, don't, don't um, touch that animal. Don't open it. And then the, the, the very last thing is don't, don't eat, uh, eat the meat from that animal, please. Okay, bacterial disease. <clears throat> Again, you can see the right top there. Um, anthrax. Anthrax, this is typically um, at the right bottom, what you will see under a microscope. As I said, I only touched on, on two viral diseases. There's many other that could, could, could play a very important role in your country. Um, but, but I think, you know, for because we've got a time limit today, I thought that, that I will only um, share with you two viral diseases. Anthrax, uh, that's caused by a bacteria, Brucella anthracis. Um, it's usually ingested or inhaled spores by, by grazing animals. Uh, that's how they get it. And then you get sudden death. You know, if you see an animal to, tonight, when you put it into the crawl, into the, into the crawl, there's nothing wrong. Tomorrow morning, that animal is dead. Um, especially if it's lying there, it's, it's bloated, you know, it's, it's very bloated, full of gas, and there's blood or blood-tinged fluid coming out of all the orifices, out of the mouth and out of the um, rectum and so on. Do not open that animal, because you can become infected. There is a very, very good vaccine, and I think it's, it's, Necessary that you do need to, to vaccinate all animals against an, um, anthrax um, as, as required by, by government. And then another problem is um, contagious abortion. Contagious abortion, um, usually the animal can become infected as a young calf or it can be, uh, become infected as an adult animal. And then the, the, this is again uh, Brucella abortus is the bacteria uh, causing this disease. That, that uh, bacteria will go into the, into the uterus. There's a, a specific um, erythritol, it's a specific sugar, you know, that, um, that this bacteria uh, prefer to, 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 to have. And it will go into the uterus and then it will cause damage to the, to the placenta, you know, to the fetal membranes, it will cause damage there. And then this animal, this is usually at about six to, six to seven months of age, and this animal um, will abort. And again, as you can see at the right top there, the possibility of, of um, uh, that you can contract this and you don't want to have it. Fortunately, I haven't, I haven't got it in 40 years, but please, if you do have it, go to the doctor immediately. Usually you, you become depressed, you, you don't want to work. Um, you know, you, you've got sometimes you've got a, a very high fever. Usually at night time you will have a high fever and it can also go down. And this is the same. You can also get this from, from drinking um, goat milk. And you can get it from, from drinking milk from a cow there. So please, this is again, this is zoonosis, vaccination. You know, there's good vaccine, vaccines available. Animals should be vaccinated about um, to three, three to um, eight months of age. Now, if you look at another group, the glostridial diseases, and I'm not going to discuss this in detail, um, there's, you know, different systems that they can affect. You know, it can affect the, the muscles, can affect the intestine. Usually the, these ones in the intestine is younger, um, usually in your young calves. Um, these ones we, you will get it in the older animals. Um, you can also, you know, this is usually affecting the, the liver in the older animal. And then um, tetanus and botulism affecting the, the, the nervous system, um, system. You know, this is a typical, this could be a clostridia animal. You can see it's bloated. When you go there, especially I will discuss um, a quarter evil just now, or black quarter as they sometimes call it. Um, you know, this this is a typical uh, uh, picture that you will get with an animal that um, died, died from um, quarter evil. The animal on the right hand side, you can see it's not, not a cow, it's a sheep. Um, animals, acute, acute death in animals is not always um, um, a clostridial disease. You can see the wire there. This was um, this animal was was struck by lightning, or well, it actually struck the wire there, and then it ran a, 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 along the wire, and this this is by because um, the reason why this animal is dead. You, here you can see you know sudden death. There you can see the the this tree was struck by lightning. You can see the dead animal there. 
you know, the animal was still eating there and now it's dead. And you see this uh, the typical uh, burning uh, little uh, path that will be on the animal. So yes, we, we need to look at clostridial disease. Uh, Blackwater as an example, uh, um, Clostridium chauvi, um, a very, very important disease. You will, you will cut open the animal and you will see, actually when you feel the animal, it will uh, crepitate. Crepitation means that it feels like gas, uh, gas um, just under the skin. That, that gas, you know, is part of this whole bacteria, when it replicates, it will form carbon, carbon dioxide. But if you open up that animal, you will see it on the inside there. And if you've cut this open once, once in your life, you will remember that smell. It's a, it's, you know, it's a very, put, put, it's a putrefied smell. Um, but it's always, you know, the bacteria will um, turn the, the muscle black like, like, like what I've got at the bottom there. Again, you know, this is a acute disease. Um, but fortunately, there's vaccines available. So I want you to look at this. Um, usually, you know, there's not many clinical symptoms. Tonight, the animal is okay. This morning, the animal is okay. Tonight, it's dead. You know, it's a, a, one of the acute um, diseases. Um, when, you, when you catch it very, very early, and you're actually uh, very clever to catch it very early, you can actually inject it with an antibiotic, and the antibiotic can, can, uh, can cure, cure that animal. But usually you, um, you're too late. So the best thing is to, to vaccinate your animals and then give the vaccines at, at six to nine months in the young, young animals. Um, and then, you know, every, um, every year until the animals are about three to four years old. Tuberculosis, another bacterial disease. I'm going to, to speed up a little bit. Unfortunately, there's, there's no vaccine available, but you can see what, what this bacteria is doing to the lungs. And then this is again on the right top, you can see it's a zoonosis. So yeah, we, we know, don't need to, to stop drinking milk and stop eating um, um, meat from the, from the animals. But unfortunately, you know, we can get a lot and contract a lot of diseases from these animals. Okay, then um, monaemia or pastorella. You can see the typical uh, lungs with monaemia. Um, the, those lungs are, you know, no, none of these lungs are normal anymore. Here's the liver and the gallbladder at the back here. Um, this is the, the lungs that we did open there. Uh, but it's usually this, um, what we call, um, it almost looks, look, looks like liver. You can see this liver on this side and, the, and that part there is my, almost the same, same consistency. You know, it's a very thick, it's not the typical pink um, normal lung that you do get. So again, you know, when you, when you slaughter animals again, look at the lungs and look at what the normal lung look, looks like. And then you can go back to this animal and say, but you know, this is not normal. This isn't a sick animal. Um, a bit more detail is, is, is the problem, you know, that I understand that you do have an um, abundant, you know, you've got enough of this um, hemorrhagic septicemia. You know, this is an acute, highly fatal form of pastorellosis, and this is caused by pastorella multocida serotype B2 or E2. Um, some of the clinical symptoms at the bottom, um, animals, you know, animals could be carriers of this. They could be carriers of this up in their tonsils. Yes, cows also do have tonsils. Um, but, but then when they become sick or during periods of high stress and high, high temperature and so on, they actually start sharing this bacteria and then they can um, start infecting the animals around them. Um, but yeah, the, the clinical symptoms is about one to three days. So the incubation period is about one to three days and then eight to 24 um, hours after that. So, you know, uh, one day, 24 hours later, that cow can be dead. Um, you can get it in older calves, you can get it in young adults. Um, uh, clinical symptoms, uh, fever, again, hypersalivation, a lot of um, drooling, um, nasal discharge, and then most definitely um, difficult um, respiration. And typically what you also can get is, you know, this um, swelling at the bottom of, of the jaw. You know, that's typically what you will get there. Um, but also when we need to look at some of the um, differential diagnosis, it could be salmonellosis, it could be anthrax, could be black leg, could be lightning struck. Um, you, usually a lightning strike is a dead animal. Um, it could be snake bite also, and in, in, even in your area, you know, one, one need to consider that. But yeah, there is, as, as I understand, there's a vaccine available. Um, you know, it's all killed vaccines, and one, one need to look at that. But also one, one need to look at the, the so-called um, stress factors. One need to eliminate those stress factors, um, you know, uh, concurrent infections, poor nutrition. Nutrition is, is very, very important in the dairy cow. If there's poor nutrition, that animal will become sick. That animal's I mean, immune system will be affected. 
and eventually we will we will sit with a problem there. Okay, so that's for hemorrhagic um, septicemia, then protozoal diseases. Um, Nagana, I'm not going to tell you more about Nagana or trypanosomiasis. I think you all know enough about this, but yes, um, this is a, a huge problem in your area. Fortunately, we don't get it in South Africa anymore. Um, it was in South Africa. We were able to actually to, to get rid of it in South Africa. So it is um, possible to eradicate the disease. But I think um, one need to start to, um, with the tsetse flies. And then there is some um, therapeutic drugs available. So if you see those clinical symptoms on the left-hand side, anemia, you know, you, if you look at the animal and it's white in the eye, it could be anaplasmosis, it could be um, red water or babesiosis, but it can also be type or nagana or trypanosomiasis. Um, usually what you will get is the enlarged lymph nodes. You know, ask your veterinarian to show you where the lymph nodes are. Abortion, you know, it's one of the reasons for abortion because of the high temperature. Um, fortunately, there's, there's some therapeutic um, drugs available, some very, very good drugs available. Um, again, speak to your veterinarian, you know, if you can, can catch this cow very early, you can actually um, treat it and it can recover from, from trypanosomiasis. Red water, <coughs> a huge problem in South Africa, I think in your area also, because if I look at the, the number of ticks or the, the species of ticks that you do get there, um, Ripicephalus or the normal blue tick, appendiculatus, um, you know, that's the typical ticks that we also do get here. Again, high fever, dark urine, you know, that's where the name red water is coming from. Um, there's some other causes also for red urine, but usually if you see dark, dark brown, almost coffee colored urine, start thinking about red water or uh, babesiosis, as they call it. And then another disease, you know, this is carried by the bull, it's usually the male, male animal, animal that will carry this. In South Africa, we're fortunate we've got a vaccine available against this, but this is a, what we call a sexually transmitted disease. And I think there's a very nice uh, picture there on the right hand side there of this organism. It's actually in, in the sheath of the bull, and every time when it gets to the cow, you know, when it mates with the cow, it will transmit this disease. And it's not immediately, but at, at about 16 to 18 weeks uh, after um, conception, this animal will then abort. And this is a huge, if you see a lot of animals, especially um, female animals with, with pus, you know, a little bit of pus coming out of the back of the vagina, um, start thinking about um, the possibility that, that you do have um, trichomoniasis in your head. Okay, rickettsial diseases, quickly on that, um, the, the tick-borne um, gall sickness. Um, this is a, um, it's again transmitted by a tick. Um, it can be um, transmitted by unsterilized needles and biting insects and flies and so on can also transmit. Usually, you know, this is not an acute disease and you won't see um, uh, coffee or dark colored urine here. The urine over time will become yellow and then a little bit more yellow and eventually, you know, almost like, like orange yellow. And um, because the animal will, the, the, the liver will be affected and then you will go into a, a jaundice and that um, will affect that animal. Um, a, a very good clinical symptom, you know, if you put, put your hand into the rectum of the cow, uh, you, you will get um, a dumb, you know, the dumb or the feces of the cow is almost the same as, as what you will get in the horse. So it's a little, round little bow, bow, um, uh, balls, bow, balls of dung that you will feel, um, feel in the, on the inside. Or if the cow is defecating, uh, you will also see that. Conditions associated with nutrition, as I said, are very, very important there. Yeah, you need to get a nutri nutritionist on board. Um, you can see at the top there, you know, that's the interaction between the different minerals. This is an old discussion for a week long, you know, to, to look at this, a specific nutrient deficiencies, excesses or, or you know, imbalances, and then most definitely also metabolic disturbances. Poisoning, I did touch on this, you know, you can get minerals, um, get uh, pesticides, you get drugs, contaminated food and water. These are all things that, that you know, um, if you look at animal health, and again, behind this, I've got about 20 or 30 or 40 slides to discuss it in, in detail. I can't, unfortunately, because of time, sh share with you anything, everything here. Okay, so that was for the infectious causes. You know, if you look at um, internal and external parasites, um, this is also, you know, very, very important. And I think also in your area, one need to understand you get roundworms, you get tapeworms, you know, the, the flatworms. And then you also get uh, what we call um, flukes or your, your liver fluke as an example. 
One need to understand, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to do it in a lot of detail, but one need to understand the, the life cycle of this um, um, parasite. Um, let's let's start to the back there. You know, usually the, the eggs, you know, okay, the, you will get a, a mature um, mature male and a female in the intestine. They will mate, and then the, the female will produce eggs. And that eggs will be be passed in the feces. That um, eggs will then land on the you know with the, the dung pad. Um, it will with the manure pad. It will land on the on the grass. Um, the eggs will hatch, and then you get your your what we call the the first and the second infectious stage of the larvae will be will be there. Um, usually, they will then um, keep keep uh, keep keep themselves happy in that little dung pad there. They they will melt to the fourth um, or to the not to the fourth to the third larval stage, and then they will start um, crawling up up onto the grass there. And if this cow then comes there and she eats again there because she's hungry, she will also pick up that larvae there. And that's the important part. One need to break this cycle. You know, there's various products that will have an effect on, on the larvae. There's, there's um, products available that will kill the adults in the intestine. And then again, yeah, you need to speak to your technician or to your um, veterinarian. You know, he can most definitely assist you on this, how to break this life cycle. You know, you can do, if you've got the, the, um, the possibility to, to actually to put them in one camp, deworm them and take them to, to another camp, you know, that's all ways to, to break this whole cycle. That's the nematodes. And then I'm not going to discuss, you can later on, when you, when you get the presentation, read yourself there. But that's, you know, just some of the um, different worms that you can get in a cow. This is a very important one, this brown stomach worm, and I think you've also got it there. This one, this worm will, will suppress the, the appetite. So if you've got this this um, this worm in the cow, um, it will suppress, it will um, produce a, a, a substance that will go back to the brain and say, tell this cow, listen, it's not necessary to eat. And because of that, this cow will, will get thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually you will have a problem there. Um, Cesto, it's the tapeworm, again, a life cycle there. You know, it's a, the so-called flatworm that you do get. Um, and then the liver fluke, the liver fluke the same. And the liver fluke is, is a little bit more um, difficult or um, involved. You know, you do get, again, it's as the... Uh, the, the, it, where, where can we start? Um, okay, start, start at the eggs here. The adult fluke in the animal, animal she um, will lay eggs. Um, the, the eggs will be passed. It will be on the, on, the, on the grass. It's usually close to water. Then it needs this intermediate host, the snail there. It will go into the snail, one or two another, um, cycles there, and then it will call, produce this, what we call the mericidium. This mericidium will again crawl up onto the grass, and then this cow will come there, she will eat it, and it will go, the whole life cycle will just continue. So there's diff different products available, you know, that you can cure this, and that, that you can take care of this. Okay, um, we'll just see, we've got some um, five or six minutes left. Um, external parasites, serial disease, uh, serious diseases. Again, yeah, the life cycle, understand the life cycle there. Um, the the adult, adult tick, this is a male adult tick, but, but the female will come out and she will lay, lay, lay eggs, um, anything between 10 to 30,000 eggs uh, laid by one animal, uh, one, one tick. So that will be on the grass. If you've got a, a one house tick, this, this whole life cycle will happen on one animal. Um, if you've got a two house tick, you know, it, it could fall off, it um, can get onto another animal or it could get, get back onto the same animal. And then we get what we call a, a three house tick. Um, the, the life cycle there, the, the one host ticks would be, you know, your, your typical blue blue ticks, you know, I think you all do see them from time to time on the animals. Um, the blue tick, you know, the whole life cycle could happen on one animal. Usually the, um, the tick will fall off, um, lay the eggs, and then that uh, larvae or the eggs will hatch, and then the larvae will then get onto the animal, uh, melt into the nym nymphal stage, melt into the animal uh, or into the adult stage, and then from there it will then um, go to, you know, um, cause all the problems. Usually when the stick is sucking blood, it will actually transmit, you know, when you go back to um, some of these diseases. Where's my diseases now? Yeah, um, the ketchup diseases. Well, while the stick is sucking blood, this organism, you can see it in the blood cells there, you know, that organism will be transmitted to the animal. And the same with, with um, red water. While, while the stick is sucking blood, 
that little organism will be um, injected through the saliva into the bloodstream of the animal, and there it will start um, making all its problems that it can, can, can create. Okay, um, external parasites, the ticks. This is a very important slide, you know, to understand um, tick management and what you need to do. This is uh, the rainfall pattern from, from one of your areas, I think from the oil district that I got from the internet. Um, but you can see, usually, you know, in January, February, March, April is, is relatively dry in your area. Then in May, the first rain, rain will come. June, July, August with the peak of the rain rainfall season in, in August. You know, in South Africa, that's usually it's the other way around. Our, our rainfall is usually um, October, November, December, and then January, February. But the, but the important thing is also here. Yeah, if you look at the, the rainfall, the rainfall is usually associated also um, with temp the high temperatures. Um, usually, you get your very high temperatures here yeah, in, in you know January, February, March, and then it's a little bit lower in in, um, um, in June, July, August there. But, but the important thing is, you know, temperature and your temperature of 32 degrees Celsius is, is high enough, you know, to, to actually to, to have a tick throughout the whole season there. But if it's associated with temperature, with, with rainfall also, then this could be the reason why you actually do get high, high problems with um, in what we call incidences or a high number of cases of, of red water and then tick-borne diseases, you know, during this period. So I would suggest at the beginning of May, you know, just at the beginning of May, to go in there with a product like like Doramectin, you know, Dectomax or Ivermectin, um, Ivermax as an example, inject the animal there, then you can get rid of that, especially the blue tick, you know, the Doramectin, very, very effective against your blue tick, and then you can, this this peak, you know, the same like what we've seen now recently with um, COVID, you know, we can prevent this peak because they're the same, um, will be the the, the, um, the the graph of ticks will be the same as this rainfall pattern here. So if you inject it there very early, you can flatten this curve and you can make sure you know that there's almost almost no ticks there, and then you can overcome that problem then there. Okay, there's prevention, there's plunge tips, there's spraying, there's porons available, very good good quality. I looked at some of the porons available in your country. You need to understand the different, you know, you get organophosphates, you get um, amidines, you get um, uh, pyrethrins, pyrethroids, and so on. What are you going to use? And then, and then also, you know, if you've got one or two animals, there's also a very good um, tick, tick grease available that you can put on the animal. And then also part of that, this would be, you know, the prevention and control would be pasture management. And then uh, public, en public enemy number one, there should not be any flies on a dairy farm. You need to do what, whatever you can, you know, to get rid of these flies, flies because they transmit disease. They transmit pink eye, they transmit brucellosis, they transmit, even if it's a biting fly, they can transmit lumpy skin disease, um, even anthrax can be transmitted. So, okay, what, what you need to do, again, speak, speak to your animal health technician or to your veterinarian. They can tell you exactly what you need to do. You know, in South Africa, we've got, an, as an example, these a small little wasp uh, that's available. Um, you can put them, you know, in your dairy, you, you can buy them, and then what they will do is they will go and lie an egg um, on the inside of this pupa. So uh, the adult, adult fly will go away, you will get uh, the fly eggs, it will, will hatch, and then you get the fly larvae, and that will then go into the pupa. So this little wasp will um, lay eggs there, and then the eggs, when they, you know, the same livestock on the inside there, but then this wasp, when they hatch on the inside of this pupa, um, they, they will actually eat the, eat the fly. And you can then, by, by doing that, you can break this life cycle. Okay, so that's in a very, very short period. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it's just very difficult, you know, to, I would like to spend six years with you on this. And maybe it's a, it's a good time now, if it's I to invite me to, to, to um, Nigeria, you know, and I would like to um, discuss that at farm level with everybody. Um, you know, what you can do to, to prevent disease. But um, I think it's important to look at the role of the veterinarian. You know, I'm, I'm going to open this and you can read it later on. The veterinarian is not only there for emergency visits. He, the veterinarian should become the, the very, very important role player in your, when you've got one cow, two cows, or a thousand cows, he must play the very, very important role to tell you exactly, he's a qualified um, scientist, and he can tell you exactly to use what, what, what you need to use here, what this, what that, and if there's a problem, you know, you can also take care of that. 
So the, the, the very um, physical, if I can finish here, the very last slides on biosecurity. This is just, uh, you know, some of the slides from, from one of our uh, modules. This is module 13 on biosecurity. Um, I did touch on the, on the risk factors. You need to minimize the risk. Especially again, you know, the, the ones that I mentioned earlier that I, that I had in red you know, to, on that one slide. Animal health, animal welfare, biosecurity. And that's um, going to be, um, you know, the, the, whether you're going to be a successful dairy farmer or not is if you do have biosecurity in place. And in biosecurity, and this is a long discussion that we do have in the presentation, uh, you know, you need to look at the role of the animals. What are you going to do? What tests are you going to do? The role of people. There should not be every day somebody in a dairy parlor. There should not be every day somebody in, the, in your calf camps because they can bring disease into your head. Into your, uh, and then the very, very important role of, of programs, immunization programs, uh, deworming programs, um, dip dipping programs, all those things. Um, we do need to, to, or the veterinarian can play a very important role there. Um, the, yeah, so vaccines, um, part of this um, programs itself, Vaccines is, is just something, you know, this is something that's given to us that can assist you. You can't manage a farm out of a bottle. You can't think you, you, if you use a vaccine at the incorrect time or you use the incorrect vaccine, you're going to waste your time. So we need to look at this, you know, we need to look at the vaccination programs with the PAFs, the replacement stock, and then also the adulthood. And in the end, is, yes, we're vaccinating the individual calf, the, the you know, uh, there's a number, you know, it's calf number two or calf number three, you're vaccinating. But what we want to do is to get to what we call um, herd immunity. You want to, to get as, uh, as, uh, as high as a number of those animals um, to, um, to be protected against um, anthrax, against um, pastorella or whatever is the problem there. Okay, this is a vaccination, vaccination program. I'll finish now. Um, and then the development of the immunization program. This is maybe emphasize something, you know, that we can do at the later stage. This is about a, a two-day course, you know, where you go into this in, in detail. Um, but, you know, work with your right veterinarian. Make sure that you use the correct vaccine. And make sure uh, when, you, when you use this vaccine that you actually, you know, that you keep this vaccine. Um, never, never vac um, freeze a vaccine, except if you use certain vac vaccines like hot water and so on. You can freeze them. But most vaccines need to be kept between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. And in your country with, uh, with high temperatures, you can't go out and go and work with the animals and then just la leave the vaccine in the, in the sun. Because you're going to waste your time. Eventually, you're just going to inject water and you're not going to get, uh, what we say, a, a good quality immune response. So, yeah, I, I could have shown to you this to you in the beginning. I did show it to you in the beginning. But this is a basic um, vaccination program with some of the important diseases listed here. And then I would like to, if I, I would like to discuss this in more detail, maybe at the late, later stage. You know, so um, I, I've only had an hour, and I think I, I've, I've been busy now for more, a little bit more than an hour. So, so from my side, um, thank you for, for, for your time, and I open it then for questions, for Zaya, if we do have any questions now. Hello, thank you very much, Dr. Chris, for this um, session. I would now invite um, the participants to ask questions if there are any. And please drop your full name and email addresses on the chat box if you haven't, so that you can get your certificates. And we'll also send this presentation to you after this um, session. So questions, please, if you want to talk, you can um, simply um, indicate by dropping a message on the chat box or unmuting your mic and just speak directly. Now, for, for Zaya, while, while the people are thinking, you know, again, the invitation from my side, you know, this is my passion and this is what, what I would like to share with you people. But, but if, if animal health is in place, you, you're 50% there, then you need to look at nutrition, uh, good quality cows, uh, genetics, you know, you need to look at the genetics, your breeding and so on. But, but you can make a success of a dairy farm, you know, you just, yes, we've got a lot of um, uh, problems or a lot of risks that, that can actually affect the, the, the dairy herd.
But, but in the end, is if you do look at it and you t- take note of it carefully, one, one can make a success of it. And if you look at f- food security and, and food safety, you know, this is the role that we need to play. And especially in a country like, like Nigeria, you know, um, also in South Africa, many, many people going out with, with good quality food. We've got a good quality product in the form of milk that we can offer to the, um, to the people out there. And then we can, you know, that, that's going to be the, um, in the end is going to be if we, uh, happy people uh, or, or people, um, uh, hungry people are not happy people. If people are not, not hungry, you know, if they had enough food, then, then they can be happy. But, but that's going to be, you know, f- food, food security is going to be um, the success of, of us as a world going forward. If we haven't got enough food and, in, and also most definitely not, not enough water, um, we're going to end up in another world war or something, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of nonsense around. Okay, Fuzaya, I don't see any questions, I don't know. Hopefully All right, I thank you very much. I actually have a question while we wait for the others. So my, I would like to ask, so in Nigeria's dairy se- sector where we have most of these smallholder dairy farmers practicing fully extensive dairy farming practice system, how can we encourage them to improve um, health management because it appears that they just move around with their cattle and when they see that one cattle is falling sick they sell it out immediately and then it is even um, a nutritional hazard to us because at the end of the day the sick cows are being um, slaughtered processed and sold in markets as um, fresh meat or even finished products such as um, suya and that's smoked meat in Nigeria. So how do you think we can um, make these smallholder dairy farmers improve their health, um, head health management? Fuzaya, yeah, uh, I see you, you said yeah, uh, my, my time is up, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's a long answer, but I'll, I'll, treat, I'll try to be short. But, but I think, you know, the, the similar type of, of um, question that you do ask, um, we, we do see in South Africa, you know, as I said, we've got a, a very good developed uh, commercial dairy market, you know, in that triangle that I showed you in the beginning. But then unfortunately, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that's in remote areas. They've got two or, you know, and there's also uh, partial farmers like, like what you've got in, 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 in Nigeria, you know, same what we get in Kenya and so on. So, so people will be, you know, they will be where there's food, they will go there. But I think in the end, is, you know, one, one must look at uh, these days, you know, there's modern facil- facilities um, like, like cell phones. You know, everybody has got a, uh, almost everybody has got a cell phone or a mobile phone these days. And I think one, one can use that to communicate, you know, and, and then to, and in certain areas where they do gather, you know, to, to maybe get people together and then show them the pictures. What, what can happen if you eat a cow with anthrax? What can happen if you do this or that? And then start telling, you know, what's the financial losses? Because a dead cow, yes, a dead cow can give you meat, but okay, you, you can also die from that. But, but it's better to keep an animal alive to, to produce milk than, than eating that cow. You know, to, to, to replace one animal in South Africa is about 10 to 15,000 rand, you know, from, for, for one animal. And you're not going to get, um, you'll get about 80% of that when you slaughter that animal. So, so you first need to get the milk out of that animal. You need to see what you can get out of that animal in the, in the sense of, of production and then milk production as such. I don't know if it's answering your question, but yeah, tell them, tell them again and then tell them again, you know, and then as I said, and then I can, I can sit down with, with Sayola later on and look at, uh, look at marketing. You know, we've, we've got some very, very good marketing um, campaigns that we do run, you know, it's like, like in the taxis, we, we've got um, radio, radio adverts going out. So the person is sitting there, he's uh, thinking about what, what he needs to do tomorrow and so on, but he's also listening to, to what the people will say. So um, I think a very good, um, and then maybe I can assist say all of that, a very good um, communication strategy is very, very important, you know, to, to get to, to to everybody. I know there, there, there's some commercial dairy herds in, 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 in Nigeria, but, but we need to get to everybody, you know, even the guy or even the person that's only milking one cow. We need to go and tell him, listen, there, there can be a problem. And then, you know, it would be wonderful if we can improve that production, say, from, from two liters per day, improve it to four liters or to 10 liters a day. Then that person can start selling that meat or, or not the meat, the, the, the milk, and he can then become in a semi-commercial way. And it's not just a, what we call a subsistence 
um, farming that you're busy with. So, so you know, it's an industry that, that's something that, that we need to discuss. And then I've, I've been involved in, in Zimbabwe, I've been involved in um, Uganda on similar type of pro projects like this. So, so yeah, please feel welcome to, to contact me and we can take it from there. Uh, uh, I hear you. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to just kept bringing sensitization, sensitization, sensitization. So we need to sensitize the farmers. We need to sensitize um, consumers of um, these products as well. Um, I have not seen any questions dropped, but there's a comment from Akam Ernest that says, Dr. Chris, your presentation was wonderful given the limited time. You did more justice to the subject matter. Um, so thank you, um, Akam Ernest. Is there any other question before we round up this session for Dr. Chris? Well, for, for, for Zai, you, you will distribute my, my email address. You know, again, the people are welcome to contact me at any time. Uh, and so um, to all the participants, um, Dr. Chris is, um, is nice enough to allow everyone to have his contact. You can reach out to him if you need some um, advice um, regarding dairy health management or some more very useful information and um, knowledge. Uh, it's, it's, I don't know if you can see my screen again, but it's on, on the screen there. You know, it says Chris Dot Van Dyke or just Chris at npo.co.za. Um, the website there, you can go go and have a look at our uh, Facebook also. And, and then my telephone number, you must just put a, a plus a plus two seven there at the front. Um, the good thing is we only were one, you know, so you won't call me when I'm sleeping. Um, I do sleep a little bit at night, but yeah, um, we only one hour um, one hour difference between South Africa and in Nigeria. So you can call me at any time. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to all the participants. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chris. Um, Dr. Obai, I see you. Thank you for joining this session. And we hope that with this um, masterclass, you have learned something new about dairy health management. And please feel free to reach out to us um, for future um, questions or collaborative opportunities. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Chris. At this point, I would like to um, say goodbye to everyone. Okay. Thank you and, and take, take care.